right, good morning, 10 o'clock, let's get started. Um, welcome to the Kernel User Space Init System Management Boundaries and APIs Microconference. Pretty sure this is the record for the longest microconference name in the history of plumbers. So we are going to have um, a lot of great talks today and start with Leonard in a minute. But first, uh, a few admin items. Let me start by thanking our sponsors. This conference will not be possible without them, so thank you, you all. Um, secondly, uh, as a reminder, um, there is an anti-harassment policy and a code of conduct, so we are here to have discussions, lively discussions, technical discussions, but let's keep it civil, please. Um, the uh, final uh, thing, as usual for every conference, um, we are live streaming, we are recording. If you have questions, please raise your hand, we'll throw you a green box and speak into the microphone. Don't just shout because we want people that are um, connected online or watching the video to also hear your question. And for the speakers, if that happens, please repeat the question in the microphone. Um, we'll have five minutes break uh, bef uh, between every talk, and that pr that's pretty much it. So let let's welcome Leonard. Do you know how to do this? Yeah, from yesterday, yeah. Okay. How do I get my slides? Like this. And like this. Right. Um, so this is supposed to be less um, of a talk and more of like, I don't know, my slides are supposed to start a discussion because I, I'm not presenting answers so much, I'm, I'm more presenting questions. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, whether we can revisit how kernels um, do init RDs because I see uh, various places where we could optimize things. Um, when I say init RD, by the way, um, uh, uh, I mean, the way how, how uh, we currently boot, um, even if it's uh, technically called in a RAMFS, um, and even that, even if that's a lie, given that it's not a RAMFS anymore, but a tempfs, um, I would just, like, from our system perspective, we always use the term init RD regardless of the actual technology used. So, yeah, in the following discussion, that's what I'm going to say, even if I don't actually mean a RAM disk, I mean the, the tempfs back thing that we do these days. So, um, to start the discussion, let's look at the status quo, um, how NRDs are actually done these days. Um, NRDs are uh, a series of typically compressed, like some of them are compressed, others cannot be compressed, uh, CPIO archive. CPIO is a very, very simple archival format, um, like tar, but in text. Um, they are loaded into memory uh, before the kernel initializes, um, so that's usually the job of the bootloader, or um, in UFI, like in, in the UKI world, it's SD stub. Um, that, uh, uh, like, or well, it's a firmware that loads a PE binary and then it's already in memory and then it's a, it's a stub that makes sure that this gets passed to the kernel. Um, it's uh, once the kernel um, did its basic initialization and starts to unpack these uh, uh, CPIOs into a tempfs. Um, this tempfs um, is already accessed before user space starts for a couple of things like uh, firmware stuff, uh, microcode, and a couple of other things. And then uh, eventually uh, uh, slash init um, uh, is invoked in it, all right? Um, so this is relatively flexible because in, in most systems these days, um, you have a couple of these CPIOs, right? Like CPU microcode is glued in front of the actual one um, uh, uh, that the OS provides. So uh, um, even though we mostly think about the latter one, we should not forget that it's, it's a series of things usually. Um, uh, the init RD, like the code that's in there, then does it sing. Uh, eventually, um, the root, like the hash, is overmounted by the final root file system. Um, this is actually relevant because it's overmounted. It's not replaced, it's overmounted. Um, then the final process, like the, the process of the actual system, is invoked. Um, uh, in the background, we then empty um, the uh, tempfs of the init RD, right? Like there's basically RMRF uh, running. Um, and uh, for the rest of the time, the super block of the, of the tempfs stays pinned, right? Like it stays around, it's hopefully empty, um, but just hopefully, nobody knows if, and, and in, in some cases, like uh, if you use plumbers or something like this, there will resources stay pinned, it's kind of weird. Um, however, it's not really visible, right? Like uh, um, because it's overmounted, it's kind of um, there, but also you don't see it. Um, so much about the status quo. I see a uh, couple of problems with this. Like, uh, you know, I uh, kind of uh, get the impression that uh, most of generic and, and not so generic distributions are probably 
going to move to the UKI world right now, meaning that you have uh, um, Vanderbilt in a dirty ease, right? Like, so uh, um, it's the Fedoras and Ubuntu's of these worlds and the RELs and so on, who will build the Inadertis on build servers and then glue them together with the kernel uh, to make a new can and sign that as a whole. But uh, that basically means Inadertis cannot be um, adjusted to the individual system how we traditionally did this, right? Um, and that implies that they get larger because they need to have uh, carry a, a larger uh, amount of drivers. Um, and uh, these Inadertis can get very large, really, because uh, we have some firmware, some drivers, which are just terribly huge, GPU drivers, usually. So um, we can, of course, add a certain level of modularity, but everything has bounds, right? Like, we, they're never going to be as small as they used to be. So uh, um, this is less than ideal, right? Like, because, um, uh, as I mentioned, like, we unpack the CPIO archives, which are compressed. Um, and we have to basically touch every single byte um, of them. And that is, uh, is uh, not the greatest thing in the world because, as mentioned, they can be quite huge. I mean, we're doing a lot of things with these entities anyway, right? Like, because they first get loaded off disk in UFI mode, which is already slow enough because um, UFI uh, disk drivers are not the best. Then we hash them for, for measurement, and we hash them again for measurement. Um, uh, then we pass them to the kernel. That's hopefully zero copy. Then we um, decompress and, and CPIO, de archives them into tempfs, and then eventually we delete them. So uh, uh, we're doing a sh shitload of stuff, and I'd rather would prefer if we don't do that where we can avoid it. We probably can't avoid it so easily um, to read them off disk and to measuring them. But uh, uh, what I think we could do is like that we don't start decompressing and uh, touching every byte. Um, even like for firmwares and drivers, we're not actually going to need because the local system doesn't have that hardware. Um, yeah, uh, the emptying of the inadertity is slow again. Um, I mean, it's not that slow, but it's still like um, if your inadertity is large, um, uh, in system do we nowadays fork off a little background process when we do the inner D to host transition, which just goes through every high node in the in the inner D and just does, doesn't unlink, um, and that's that's uh, it's not terrible because we do it asynchronously, right? Like we already transitioned otherwise to the to the real um, uh, uh, file system, but there's also a lot of busy work that we'd rather not do. Uh, it also means that uh, pivot root is not possible, you know, because in, in Linux, like um, you have a tree of mounts. And because this, this inadertity tempfs thingy is the first mount that uh, um, is established, it's the root of everything. And that makes it impossible to unmount. Um, uh, and uh, because it's impossible to unmount, you can't actually use pivot root to get rid of it. You know, pivot root is supposed to, to, to change the root thing um, from the current view. But uh, yeah, that doesn't work for the original one. That's why we actually have to empty it, right? Like, because if we could uh, pivot root it, uh, it then uh, we wouldn't have to empty it because we would just be a tempfs, and if it would go away, nobody cares, right? Um, what I also don't like about it is it's mutable, right? Like we uh, try, um, at least with in our system new worldview, to get everybody to use more immutable um, uh, OSs. But uh, for the energy, we can't, right? Like because it's a tempfs, and the kernel mounts it writable. Um, and uh, um, I mean, in, in, in recent system D, we nowadays uh, uh, broke everybody's. Um, Internities like uh, half a year ago because we decided that uh, let's let's try to lock it down a little bit at least and make slash user really early on and user space read only um, when we are running an inner That did break a couple of things, but I, I'd like it to be tougher, right? Like that user space doesn't have to do this and uh, uh, that that yeah the kernel just gives us like it unpacks it into the tempfs and makes the tempfs immutable and makes it immutable in a way that user space cannot make it mutable again. Um, yeah, because uh, I think uh, uh, boot time, integrity, and these kind of things matter. And uh, if you can can modify your inner ID, um, because inner IDs now days are network facing and whatnot. Um, yeah, it, I would. Uh, I, I think we should try to make them immutable. <coughs> so much about uh, the status quo and the problems with this. Anyone has? A, yeah, I, I kind of wanted to make this a discussion. So please, uh, you raised first. Um, let's. Uh, Start.
Yeah, um, I don't know if this will work for systemd, but there is a trick you can do to make pivot root work. Um, there is a bubble wrap has a trick that we were going to do the same thing in run C as well. Because um, no, 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 that doesn't work. That doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't work. That trick doesn't work. Okay. Because you can never unmount the root um, like the, the initial um, tempfs. Yeah, yeah. So that's off limit. Yeah, that's why we have to add. Uh, right, right. So pivot root does work for uh, like if you're in a, in a in a file system namespace, and uh, that one you can pivot right, but. It's the, the actual tree uh, root of the entire tree, you cannot. Right, but I'm talking about, so that there is, um, um, people complain about not being able to run run C inside of like a VM where, where you are in RamFS. And there is a trick that allegedly works, um, which is the, you, uh, you create an amount of namespace and then you uh, bind mount to a different directory and then you move the mount and then you CH root into the mount and then pivot root allegedly works. We can talk about this later, because I'm not sure if this will work so for this. Christian, me. like who's one okay. of the files is maintained. No. OK. <laughs> he says so. Sure. I mean, he should be around here, but yeah. He's hiding. <laughs> All right. So maybe I can provide some background on why some of these things are done. The reason root FS can't be unmounted is because it solved a huge problem that we had, which was um, what uh, what to do with uh, the root of kernel threads. We don't want the root of kernel threads to move around. And so what we never really anticipated was, um, was that um, the uh, root, that the, in it, in the tempfs, um, or in, yeah, which was originally in the tempfs, tempfs didn't exist yet. Um, that um, would you know that it would be used quite quite so large. It was meant to be a small user space um, that would just replace the in, you know a bunch of the in kernel code, and that never got merged. But it wouldn't be very hard to add to the kernel to, to overmount rootfs with a non with a non magic tempfs so um uh, one of the ideas that uh, I had okay. was actually, but it's not in this. No, case. no. We had so many problems back in the day when we mounted a, when we mounted the file system image. We so, really don't want to go no, back wait, there. Wait, wait, wait a moment. So uh, one of the things that uh, one of the ideas uh, uh, we discussed was actually introducing something like that is actually rootfs, yeah. which is a would be a, basically a, a special file system that has, has exactly one inode and yeah, that, that's what it, that's basically what I just said. That would be easy to do. Yeah, but exactly. We, we, and that would yeah. be the real root, and then the tempfs would just be something that is overmounted to that, and that would allow yeah. us uh, to Th do that. Everything. That that can that certainly can be done, and then and then you can get you know, it would be very easy to do your, um, you know, to, you know, to tell to to uh, tell the kernel to that 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 tempfs should be uh, you know should be immutable or or whatever. But one the other thing that I wanted to say was. The RM minus RF is perhaps not as big of a deal as you um, as you think it might be, because the kernel does exactly the same thing when you U mount a tempfs. Well, it has it to. But it doesn't have like the at least it doesn't have the syscall uh, overhead of like a million files. That but we... syst sy the system call overhead is relatively small in comparison. Uh. Oh, really? I don't know, like it's measurable. Like, uh, it, so. it is, but this is something that gets done one, and as you said, it's a, asynchronous. In fact, I think that you might be actually worse off because the U-mount is, is synchronous. So, the work has to be done I, I one way or the other. Like I, I mean, like, but anyway, like like for us, um, already from a security perspective, it's really ugly if there's a process hanging around from the inner dirty um, that usually comes with a completely different security policy because as a Linux and, and things like okay. that are initialized during the transition, right? So it uh, is this weird process that comes out of 
of, of a prehistoric world where, which, where it's a lot more privileged, has capabilities that, that the rest of the thing doesn't have, and just sits around there and, and does its thing um, uh, while uh, the lockdown world um, is already up there, right? Okay. Like, we'd so rather have this not. Yeah. So I think it's a performance issue, but uh, yeah, sure, I already said that it's not the biggest performance issue, but also it's a ugly now that, 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 that's, thing. That's a, that's a very different... Um, that that's a very you know and 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 obviously, if you make if you make it if you make it so that user space can't modify it at all, then you can't do that anyway. But yes, so I think that I think that um, the idea of of just a, of, of just layering a, a tempfs um, on top of the rootfs would be would be very simple to do. But I really don't think we want to go back to the world where we had a file system image, because there were so many so, problems with that. Yeah, I mean, this was one of the other ideas uh, that we were thinking about. Like, let's just make it so that eRoFs or SquashFS is the root file system. This uh, would have nice properties for us, right? Like, Preboot would still think uh, put it uh, into memory. Uh, and then uh, uh, only the files that are actually accessed um, need to be uh, uh, decompressed, and the buffer cache for this, and, and everything's nice for us. Um, but it does create problems. Like and, one of and, them is and again, you are touching that memory so many times before. Um, but it's huge memory, right? Like it's 500 megabytes sometimes. Yeah, but you are, you know, a, a tip, the typical boot, the, the typical um, firmware a bootloader will probably copy that like three times already. But you know, it's, it's not just about touching, right? it's also about decompressing. Yeah, right? but the, decompress the decompressing actually, uh, actually in a lot of cases improves performance. And you can, if you're using one of the less um, aggressive compressive compression styles, you, uh, um, you know, you, they can be, they can be fa they can be faster than the, than a non-compressed block copy. Uh, I don't know. Like uh, we didn't do the, the the detailed analysis. What's fast and what's fl slow? But it's measurable, like already for a human to see how long it takes for the for the interview to actually show up. Um, uh, uh, anyway, so but let let's, let me just say the problems that I see with the approach is simply that uh, I mentioned this earlier mm -hmm. that that uh, CPIOs we have a series of them, right? And uh, we nowadays, for, in SD stub, for example, we uh, generate uh, more CPIOs on the fly to pass in uh, the sidecar files that we pick up um, uh, that allow to parameterize and, 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 uh, uh, the, the inner ID. And these are, so, so basically this means that um, we have to expect that the kernel gets in a series of, I don't know, seven or something uh, uh, um, CPIOs passed in. Some of when we, them are relatively static and uh, uh, predefined by the West vendor, but some of them are entirely dynamic and generated on the fly um, during early boot. So somehow, if we would go for a block-based thing, we have to find a solution for um, how that's going to work, right? Like, and particularly as many of the CPIO, uh, CPIOs, like the microcode one, mm -hmm. are accessed really, really early on by the by the kernel when it initializes before user space is, is up there. Like, it has this weird thing where it directly goes to the CPIO before it even has has uh, unpacked it in a tempfs, and uh, hence uh, I figure. Whatever we do, um, this kind of behavior has to stay, and there needs to somehow be married with a block-based thing, which doesn't compress it, decompress everything. So uh, um, I don't know, like maybe um, something could work where we basically say, um, for the once user space, like the the actual mount that we set up for user space would be a block-based. Uh, uh, Eero FS or, or Squash FS, and then the uh, we would mount the CPIO stuff right, that we will always also get passed into some directory yeah. slash in or whatever. The the, the um, if you want to do that, you actually you know flip it around, you know just put just put your image, just put your image as an you know as an uncompressed item in a CPIO shows up as a file in in your init temp FS and just mount it. I mean, I guess we could do something like that. The EROFS uh, provides slash user, right? So that uh, then we do the traditional thing for all the dynamic stuff. You get your root file system set up, and then we just say that the kernel 
I mean, the kernel already um, has this magic code in there that mounts pre-mounts slash dev from dev tempfs. So if we could say that the kernel has this magic code also in there, that it pre-mounts slash user from a block device, I think I would probably be happy because then we, the kernel we, we could jump we, into that. We have that, and we've been trying to get rid of it. It, it's like no, yeah. please. We we don't we we don't want to have more magic co magic code in the kernel. <laughs> anyway, someone else wants. Yes. So there's, I think Daniel were first. Uh, uh, yeah, um, maybe crazy idea. Probably somebody was thinking about: uh, Is it possible to build file system on top of CPI or instead of uh, copying? Sure. I mean, uh, there's OverlayFS. So first of all, EROFS actually supports uh, something like OverlayFS on itself. Um, so uh, you can have a couple of EROFS images, and then they overlay, and, and they're exposed as one without involving Euro, uh, OverlayFS. And then there's OverlayFS. But um, I think it's a hard sell to kernel developers to say that the, on the kernel command line that you should be able to configure arbitrary complex OverlayFS um, I, 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 I was not saying about <laughs> OverlayFS, but I was thinking about building directly the file system on top of CPIO, so then you don't need to, sorry, uh, then, then you don't need to uh, unpack the file, uh, the, the uh, CPI auto file system. But I mean, the kernel has no functionality for this right now. The only thing that the kernel gives you is that CPIO tempfs uh, mounted to slash and uh, slash dev mounted to dev tempfs. This is the environment you typically end up with. And uh, yeah. OK, thanks. <coughs> when we are talking about the need to uh, compress, what is crucial uh, in this scenario is that we may have 500 uh, megabytes of code and we only use 150 uh, of that in a specific boot. So we w really need to have compression so that the whole image is not too large, but then um, we only decompress some subset of it. <laughs> yes. So. There is no requirement for compression. You can have, you know, you, you, if, if you want to have an EROFS image, you can just, you know, you, your user space, you know, you, that, that, part, that item, in fact, the, the init RAMFS protocol supports a mixture of compressed and uncompressed members. So you can have a, so you can have if you want an EROFS image that you can then mount. But you know, if, if you ship an EROFS image inside of a, a CPIO, then you have touched the memory already, right? Like you do get rid of the decompression, well, you, have to, you do you have not to, get you, the, rid of the additional uh, uh, unpacking thing, right? Well, OK. So first of all, see previous statement. You, you, know, you are going to be, you're going to be touching this memory a lot, so you're kind of suffering from. But, that, the, but the point is that we're not, right? Like because, as mentioned, as as, as Bigny have just said, like um, these uh, inertities are likely going to be really huge, right? Like gigabyte, yeah. even. But it's Nvidia loaded from. Computers. It's loaded from somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it is already loaded once, right? And then you yeah. like. Uh, 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 We'd rather spend the, the, the CPU cycles on actually decompressing things, um, not touching I, always like a gigabyte of data, I, but I'm instead not, of not, just uh, yeah. like the 100 I, megabyte we actually need. I'm not saying that you, what I'm saying is you don't have to decompress it. If you, if, if that, if that, there's no reason to compress an already compressed piece of data, and the init RAMFS supports that. Sure, but I mean, you, you always get the copyright. You, okay. We could change the NitRAMFS code to be zero copy if you have if you have proper alignment of an of a member. CPIO doesn't enforce any kind of alignment, but we could but we could opportunistically do it, and then you can then you could could say, okay, I'm going to align this member so that the kernel can zero copy it. Can you can you insert arbitrary alignment within a CPIO? Yeah, you can do. Um, yeah, you can do. You can you can you can, you can zero you can zero uh, put any number of, of zeros before before the next header. I mean, I guess what we could do is uh, you know uh, instead of having one CPIO with 500 files, have 500 CPIOs with one <laughs> file each, <laughs> because then you actually can insert any kind of. Uh, 
uh, alignment. Well, it actually wouldn't be that no. bad, I guess. <laughs> that, but well, the, okay, we could at least do that for the EROFs image. That's, that, that's what I'm. That's what I'm referring to. Yes, if you, if if what, because when you're doing, when you're doing the, uh, like when you're do when you're doing the the individual files, you want you you want compression. It's going to be faster, and especially once you especially once you count in just how much additional overhead you're going to have loading uncompressed data from a, a firmware device. That's going to kill you. So we have a one minute warning. Do you want to wrap it up? Uh, yeah, sure. I don't know. I'm, do I have to say anything? Like, uh, thank you, everybody, for all the good ideas, um, <laughs> HPA in particular. Um, uh, uh, yeah, that's all I had, really. So, uh, do we have a plan? Hmm? Do we have a plan? Yeah. Do we like if we can make the tempfs thing happen with that we can initialize the tempfs with zero copy? Um, yeah, I, th I think the per I think the then, then we do. <laughs> we have a plan. Well, right. now we just need somebody to actually implement that, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you, Leonard.